Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Rockman. I'm a core maintainer of Dask, and today we're going to talk about deploying Dask on distributed hardware. I give lots of fun talks about how to use Dask in lots of different contexts. This is not going to be one of those fun talks. This is going to be a very boring talk about all the things that can go wrong uh, in a more sort of enterprise or institutional setting. So this is really targeting people who are trying to deploy Dask on large architectures inside of organizations that care about things like security, governance, authentication, costs, those sorts of things. You will probably be much happier if you stop watching this video, go to YouTube and search for Dask videos. There's hundreds of other videos that are much more exciting about using Dask. and be sort of more fun than this one. Uh, that being said, if you care about saving money or security uh, in an sort of enterprise-y data science world, uh, please continue. So, as a Dask maintainer, I start my day with GitHub, uh, and I get questions like the following, right? Why can't my computer see my data? Uh, it's there. I can access it. Why can't my other workers see it? Uh, why do things slow down when I add more machines? Why does, why does the network make things slower? Uh, why does IT not let me run my computation? Uh, one of my favorites at the end here, uh, I accidentally left on uh, a big cluster of computers. Uh, I spent $10,000 help. I actually did this uh, just last week. It wasn't 10 grand, but it was you know 20 machines running for a few days. It's a really common problem, especially when you're on the cloud. So this talk is an attempt to answer these kinds of questions. We get these every day on the issue tracker, and we want to sort of compile a list of them so people could understand why they occur, and if not to solve them, figure out how to sort of build empathy between data science and IT, so we can start talking about these with a shared language. So, but before that, let's first get into what Dask is and what it does. This will be the only fun part of the talk, I promise. So uh, I sent an email out to a bunch of uh, Dask users, asking them for little snippets of how they use Dask, and I got back a bunch of little snippets. So first, uh, Dask is often used with pandas to scale out traditional data science machine learning workloads. Here we're analyzing a large set of CSV files on Kubernetes on the cloud. And Dask handles that same sort of Jupyter Notebook experience, but now at scale. Dask is also often used not with tabular data, but here with multidimensional imagery data. This is showing the ocean currents off the coast of Japan. The same Jupyter experience, but now on data that's gridded two, three, four dimensional. Dask is also used outside of Jupyter Notebooks. Here it's working with Napari, a biomedical image viewer that's powered by Dask. And this is aimed at point and click lab bench scientists, not data scientists. So Dask is really built into a lot of other applications um, that sort of use Dask to sprinkle in a little bit of parallelism like Data Shader, here a project out of Anaconda, or this, a genomics tracker uh, coming out of Oxford University. It's looking at malaria carrying mosquitoes. Dask is fully real time, it's fully streaming. It integrates into real time systems, workflow manager systems like the Prefect Workflow Manager or Airflow. Uh, and Dask is also used by companies like NVIDIA as they're building out their new GPU data science platform, Rapids. So Dask is really a bit of infrastructure that's very native to Python. It lets other Python maintainers add parallelism to their existing projects. Because of that, Dask is used all over the place, and it's often deployed in lots of different kinds of institutions. And that's where we come to our challenges today. Again, there's a whole YouTube channel of lots of fun Dask talks. If you want to learn more, I recommend starting there. Now, when we give those talks, we have this promise that you have this big pile of data, you throw a data science team at it, and you profit. That's sort of the general promise that uh, authors of data science libraries, like myself and the Dask maintainers, uh, will often say when you give these talks. Uh, there's actually a lot more to the story if you actually want to do this safely in an organizational setting. So you can do this on your own in an academic setting. Maybe it's just you, you have access to these machines. But if you want to invite teammates, if you actually care about budget, if you work in a government lab, for example, uh, you're going to want to do this a bit more. Uh, at least if you want to do this safely, which you do. So fundamentally, the problem here is that your cluster is not a laptop. We try to make it look like a laptop, we try to emulate that same experience, uh, but there's lots of other architectural problems that get in the way. So a laptop you can hold in your hands. You physically own it. No one else is accessing it. Everything is self-contained. Uh, but when you switch out to a cluster, some of those things change. 
For example, a big one, you have a single hard drive in a laptop. In a cluster, your data may live on some other, uh, some other faraway machine in a data center. Additionally, uh, on your hard drive, there's one version of Python and one version of Pandas. In a cluster, you may have hundreds of hard drives, all of which need to have the same versions of Python, the same versions of Dask. And now coordinating software environments becomes a really big deal. On a laptop, you have global shared memory. You have all of your CPU cores operating in the same process in the same, on the same data with threads. And that's really convenient to write really fast algorithms without thinking about communication. On a cluster, all of your CPU cores are connected by a complicated network of wires. That's challenging both because those wires are orders of magnitude slower, so you need to start thinking about communication costs, and because they're potentially insecure. Uh, other people can be walking into that uh, room, where all the machines are, and they can be listening on those same wires. And so you're also sort of sharing those machines with other people. And so now suddenly security becomes a big problem. On a local machine, when things break down, we have lots of tools that are disposable at our disposal for diagnostics, uh, like TOP, the Linux utility. Uh, on a cluster, we need to start collecting all those diagnostics and all those logs. That's not usually centralized. Now, there are tools for all of these things, right? You could use Prometheus for logs, Docker for software environments, etc. But we just need to start thinking about adding those technology bits into our, into our, um, into our workflow. You know, similarly, authentication and security is a big deal. We can't just walk over to all those machines, log into them one by one. That would be really annoying. So there's lots of solutions here, uh, but we will need many of them in order to surround Dask or another project like Dask. Again, Spark, a database, TensorFlow, Flink. Uh, we need a lot of tooling around those libraries to support them. So I like to break this into three different categories of environment and data management, or sort of pretending that your cluster, it looks like a laptop to the data scientist. There's things like security and compliance, or what I like to call is don't get sued and cost management, don't go broke. And so we will look through each of these categories throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, before we do that though, I wanna first pretend that we're gonna do this manually, just so we have a sense for what it is that we're trying to do and what these tools uh, help us automate. So setting up Dask is actually pretty easy. Dask is a centrally managed distributed system. So there's a bunch of workers that are a peer-to-peer -peer network of uh, Python processes that are doing work and then transferring data between each other. There's a centralized scheduler, which is like a foreman at a job site or the coach of a sports team. Uh, the scheduler is telling all the workers what to do. It's making sure that if, if one worker gets sick, someone else can swap in for that work. And then there's a client, which is where we sit with our, our machine, our Jupyter Notebook or our Python process. So if I wanted to set up Dask, you may have Dask installed already. You can try this now comes default in Anaconda, or you can pip install Dask. You would install the Dask, you would run the Dask scheduler on one machine. So you could walk up to one machine, you would log in, you'd pip install Dask distributed, and you'd run the Dask scheduler command. That would open up a, a socket on that machine and start listening for connections. We would then walk over to a few other machines. We would pip install Dask distributed, we would run the Dask worker command, and point that worker to the address where the scheduler is running. The scheduler and workers will are talking to each other, and the scheduler will inform the workers of where their peers are so they can discover each other well. Then, when we want to do work, when we want to harness all of these machines for our own self, uh, we will uh, start up a you know, Jupyter process or a Python process or run some automated script, and we will import the Dask client and connect to that same scheduler address. And that gives us access to all of these machines. We can then run Dask code, which looks very similar to normal Python code, uh, and operate at scale. And so that's great. If you have a bunch of machines sitting in your house, you can do this right now, and you will probably have a pretty good time. Uh, and we can now do our actual job, right? Lots of us, uh, this actually isn't what we normally think about doing. We usually think about doing statistics or data science or you know, curing cancer. Uh, and so many of us today are thinking about all these IT problems, it really slows us down. So once we solve these problems, we can go back to doing our actual job and providing the actual value that we're used to, to doing, that we were hired for originally. So now let's go through all of those components uh, that we talked about, all the things that get in the way. So first, environment management. How do we pretend that all of these computers are actually one single computer? 
So the first problem, this is by far the most common problem we run into, is uniform software environments. We need to make sure that we're running the same version of Python, the same version of Dask, and the same version of any libraries that you're trying to use with Dask on all those, all those machines. It's very common that someone has a different version of scikit-learn, for example, on one of the worker machines and on, on another. Uh, we are pretty good at telling people this is going on and, and alerting people about this, uh, but you need to have some mechanism to, uh, to convey the software changes in a uniform way across the cluster. This is especially important for data science for two reasons. Uh, one, different data scientists want different kinds of software environments. There's a lot of variation. And then two, these environments can change rapidly, often several times a day. Uh, this is quite different from sort of typical data engineering workloads or you know, IT workloads where environments change relatively slowly. Uh, data scientists also aren't very familiar with Docker. It's not really part of the workflow. They also may not have, just not have access to update images, especially in more locked down corporate environments. Uh, to encapsulate this, there's a tweet from Eric Ma, sort of a renowned data scientist, I think currently at Novartis. And he says, the biggest pain point about bursting the cloud is his dynamically changing project source code. He doesn't want to wait for a Docker container each and every time. Right, so this is a, a really common request. So two things to note here. First, this tweet happened yesterday. This kind of thing happens all the time. And then second, Eric is a ninja, right? Eric is actually really senior. He's not a novice. This isn't a problem with training or telling him that Docker exists. He knows that Docker exists. He could give this entire talk if he wanted to. But there's this sort of mismatch between IT and data science that's really common when you start scaling out data science on institutional hardware. So moving on, resource sharing. Uh, 10 years ago, if you did this, you would email your colleagues and say, hey, I want to use the cluster, is anyone on it? Someone would say, no, I'm using it for the next hour, and you would coordinate manually. That becomes a lot harder when you are both sharing this cluster with production workloads, which is more often the case these days, and also sharing it not with a few colleagues, but with a thousand colleagues. Fortunately, there are excellent solutions to this. Uh, software solutions like Yarn from Hadoop, uh, HPC job schedulers like Slurm, PBS, or LSF, and more recently, systems like Kubernetes, which are done on use a more modern machines, and also commonly on the cloud. Uh, these absolutely solve this problem. They're designed to share and split a cluster between lots of different uh, users. Uh, some challenges, though, uh, these clusters are more often configured for production and not for data science workloads. Uh, they often don't have uh, authentication for a thousand people uh, configured for them. They're often not designed to allow people to burst up for 100 machines and have those machines taken away. Uh, you can certainly do that with systems like Kubernetes, but it does require a bit of configuration, uh, which often isn't typical these days, at least uh, as we've seen it. Uh, the third main point, third main uh, headache for mimicking the laptop experience uh, is data access. So data scientists have a lot of experience running, using files on their laptop, right? We all have done this for decades. We've downloaded files from the internet, we've opened them up, we've used file browsers, we've used a terminal, we've used lots of systems to manage files on our machine. That intuition goes away over time uh, when we switch to um, the cloud or we switch to distributed systems, right? Because that laptop experience, that single hard drive experience has changed. Now our data might be on Amazon S3, for example, which has a new interface for us to learn. So something that requires a bit of change. So we're always going to need to use some sort of shared file system, be that a network file system, an HPC machine, or a cloud object store, like S3, GCS, or Azure Blob File Storage. Okay, so moving on, let's move from the pains of the data scientist to the pains of the IT professional. Uh, so this is all about ensuring that the right people can access their data and the wrong people can't. And this is a real balance between making things easy for everybody while also making sure that security concerns are handled uh, in a mature way. So going back to our previous problem, a really common situation is that everything works for the shared data on your local machine, but when you have to go to execute that on distributed hardware, one of your machines doesn't have the right credentials. Right? So maybe you have some, some AWS credential file that you have locally on your laptop, and when you spin up machines on Kubernetes, those Kubernetes pods, they don't know who you are. Kubernetes isn't impersonating you properly. 
Now, ideally, you have some system that can move those credentials around in a safe, secure way. If you don't, or if that system is a pain to deal with, data scientists will do this on their own. They'll work around that system. And that's really dangerous because they're sending these credentials in the clear uh, or they're leaving credential files around on these machines. So this is really a case, if you want to support data scientists, where ease of use ends up translating into secure. Uh, and doing this well can be a little bit tricky, but it's absolutely possible. It just requires a little bit of care and uh, some communication with other parts of your organization. Uh, IT usually doesn't solve this on their own if they don't also listen to data scientists' requests. Uh, and then network security. This is a fun one. So systems like Dask, or again, like Spark, TensorFlow, Flink, etc., are designed to run arbitrary user code sent across the network on hundreds of machines. From a security perspective, that is a nightmare for a few reasons. Uh, let's look at this example. So we have Alice is uh, starting up a Dask scheduler on one machine. And then Bob is connecting to that same machine from his Python process. He happens to know the location where Alice has started that scheduler. If, as we saw in the last section, you pass around credentials properly, Bob can now impersonate Alice. He can look at her data, he can edit her data, he can make changes with her credentials. Uh, this is uh, uh, scary as heck. Uh, the standard solution to this is to use standard security network protocols like TLS uh, or SSL. Uh, this is very straightforward. Any system like Dask that's mature will have security everywhere. Um, that being said, you will still need to integrate this into your auth system somehow, your certificate authority. Uh, very straightforward thing to do, but does always require a little bit of a little bit of effort in every organization. And then finally, the third category we're going to look at is costs. Uh, this is a this is a big topic. Uh, what we're trying to do here in scalable data science is give as much power as we can to data scientists, even if they don't have a lot of technical expertise in spinning up large systems. Uh, this accessibility question is amazing, right? We're allowing you know, people in developing countries to access petabytes of data on the climate that affects their future, and that's fantastic. But giving that broad access to these very powerful systems uh, does come with a lot of financial cost, especially if we're on the cloud. Uh, so I like to think of this in terms of three categories, avoid, optimize, or avoid, track, and optimize. So uh, data scientist workloads are interesting in that they're often very bursty. Uh, often we will uh, load up a large data set. We rent a thousand machines for five minutes. Uh, we then produce some plot. Then we spend the next hour staring at that plot. And during that hour, hopefully we've given those machines back, right? Hopefully we're not paying for those thousand machines while we're doing that idle work where it's the human in the loop, that interactive exploration process where we don't need machines, we just need time to stare at a plot. And then we make some small tweak and we run that computation again. So that burstiness, uh, that lack of consistency can be very costly uh, if those machines aren't given back. The, the best solution we found to this is adaptive scaling. So systems like Dask can look at your workload and adaptively allocate machines on the fly for you. And then more importantly, give them back when you're not doing those, that work. Uh, putting this on by default is a, is a lifesaver uh, for costs. Uh, also things like automatic idling time timeouts and enforced usage limits if your resource manager supports them. Uh, these are great ideas, uh, they're often not on, on by default and usually needs some mechanism with which to enforce them. Uh, we see this uh, as fairly ad hoc today. There aren't really standard solutions to doing this to enforce it. Uh, okay, uh, the next major point is tracking. So uh, even if you turn on adaptive scaling, data scientists will find a way around it, uh, especially if that scaling doesn't happen quickly. If you have long queue times, for example, or you can't get a lot of machines very quickly, a data scientist will often hold on to those machines. They'll sort of ping a worker every once in a while just to keep it alive. And so you really do want to have some sort of tracking. Uh, typically today, this is done with systems like Prometheus uh, or proprietary cloud, cloud tooling. Uh, and you just want to see, you know, for every given user, for every given group, for every given workload, uh, are they using their machines effectively? If they're renting GPUs, are those GPUs actually being used? And then finally, cost. Uh, so as everyone has transitioned to the cloud, this becomes a bigger and bigger deal. Um, we're very used to profiling and optimizing Python code, 
But when we are renting machines from the cloud, that profile and optimization switches from being just about performance and time to being about money. And if your institution has you know, multi-million dollar cloud monthly bills, you know, 10% uh, change in that, 10% optimization can be your salary. It's a very good way of justifying yourself. Uh, unfortunately, distributed profilers are, are rare. Uh, Dask has an excellent one. I would say even on a single machine, Dask's profiler is one of the better ones in the Python language. Um, so we recommend using it uh, and just checking these things from time to time. This is, again, a great way of saving money, especially when you're operating at scale. So that's it. Those are all the things that we've seen uh, happen wrong when you deploy data science compute systems like Dask in institutional settings, be they companies, government organizations, scientific research labs, etc. There are many great solutions to all of these problems. Every problem we just talked about, there's a solution for. But typically, you do need to stitch those, those all together. And that ends up being a bit, a bit challenging. So for all the problems that we've talked about, there are solutions. Right, and here are solutions that solve each individual ones of those problems. Dask has uh, things that integrate with all of these systems, or at least many of them. Right, friendly resource managers, for example, Kubernetes, Yarn, JobQ, job queuing systems. Dask has good integration. For data access, the Dask maintainers actually maintain these libraries in the Python ecosystem. Uh, they're not just for Dask, we just happen to maintain them. For things like security and compliance, uh, Dask Gateway is a great project that's you know, secure everywhere, integrates lots of different auth systems like Kerberos. Uh, cost management, we have decent profiling, but these tend to be handled by other sorts of systems. Uh, again, like Prometheus, Datadog, or a variety of proprietary cloud tooling systems. Uh, Dask actually does decently well here, but other systems will also have solutions for these problems. They will also integrate with these technologies. Uh, all of these platforms will need uh, support from different kinds of tooling. You could also buy a managed solution. Uh, warning, uh, I work for a company that sells such a managed solution. So I'm gonna put on my for-profit sales hat just for a second here. Hope you don't mind. So many open source projects have companies behind them that will sell a managed solution for you and will have opinionated solutions for all of these problems, right? They'll give you these lovely reassuring green check marks to help you get past IT. Uh, if you care about Dask, uh, you could look at Coiled Computing. Uh, a few of the Dask maintainers and I uh, split off. We're now running this company uh, to help solve these sorts of problems. We do lots of other things too. Come check us out at coiled.io. That being said, I'm going to take off my for-profit hat for a second. Managed solutions aren't always ideal, so you shouldn't trust anything I've said. Uh, you're always buying someone else's opinions, and they're usually close, but not quite what you wanted. Uh, you know. Systems like Confluent were designed with a particular kind of workload in mind. Your workload might be a little bit different. Uh, they cost money. Uh, they're always making a profit. Uh, typically, this tends to be around 40% if you're using, say, AWS managed services like SageMaker, or maybe up to 100% if you're using something like Databricks, which is a little bit on the pricier side. Um, they'll also try to lock you in. Right? They're all trying to give you features to lock in your data. They're all trying to uh, keep you as a customer. And so the incentives aren't always quite aligned. That being said, they're still often better than maintaining a new IT team. Uh, if you're starting out, they're usually a no-brainer. You should always go for something like this. Even if you're a more advanced organization, usually the cost savings can be, uh, can be worth it. So in summary, thanks for listening. Uh, three main points. Uh, one, Dask is neat. You should go check out Dask. You're already watching this on YouTube or some video system. You should go to YouTube right now, look for other Dask examples or go to the Dask Examples uh, page at examples.dask.org. There's dozens of fun things. You'll find something that fits you. Uh, second main point, uh, deploying software in large organizations is complicated. Um, it's definitely not for the, the faint of heart. And then third, you might want to check out dask.org or coil.io. Thank you again. My name is Matthew Rockland from Coiled and Dask Maintainer. Uh, thanks for your time. Cheers. <laughs>